Thank you for staying with us. It's still Plus Politics now. Uh, let's look at Nigeria's ranking as one of the most corrupt countries in 2022. Now, Nigeria, again, has scored 24 out of 100 points while ranking 150 among 180 countries in 2022. Corruption Perception Index, released by Transparency International on Tuesday, had stated this. Although the country maintained its previous year's 20, that's 2021's score of 24 out of 100 points there was a change in the rank from 154 to 150 that's like f9 as of say, so for some other countries uh, they they seem to have performed more poorly in 2022 now the tools for measuring the levels of corruption were based on prevalent indices such as bribery diversion of public funds public officials using public offers for private gain without consequences the ability of governments to contain corruption and enforce effective integrity mechanisms in the public sector. Uh, they talked about red tape and excessive bureaucratic burden, amongst many other factors. Well, joining us to break this down this evening, we have Wemimo Adomi. She's a media strategist and communication expert. We're also being joined by Benga Ashiru. He is the ADC chairman for Lagos State. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Good evening. Good evening, my pleasure. Good evening. Um, it's George, because I know you keep calling oh. your colleague from China. <laughs> George, it's so good to have you join us. For a second there, I knew something was wrong. Uh, let me start with you, Webimo. As, as a journalist, of course, um, every, every year when Transparency International and all of these indexes, uh, um, in, um, you know, um, indexes come out, we're always looking for where Nigeria is. And then, of course, we look at the measures, whatever they're using to measure, um, you know, how corrupt we are or how less corrupt we are. Um, but then, of course, a lot of people have been talking about why Nigeria had to move, you know, um, a few points up, um, but then still maintain a particular number. Now, I want to go through some of the, you know, the reasons they gave. Absence of transparency during COVID-19, nepotism in public service, lack of adequate corruption, legal framework, etc., etc. I'll, I'll stop there. For the government of President Buhari, who rode into power with the number one reason being that they were going to fight corruption, um, what does this say, especially as Mr. President is about to bow out after, tw uh, after the elections in February? I mean, that's a very good place to start. I mean, uh, everyone knows that the president, when he came into power back in 2015, one of the things he rode on was a fighting corruption. And being uh, a military man, I mean, it, it was easy to believe that he would be able to achieve that, which I believe is why Nigerians voted for him in 2015 and, and possibly a repeat in 2019. Because before then, uh, the Good Luck Jonathan administration was started to be really corrupt. And Nigerians were looking forward to a government that could change all of that, save us some money, jail some corrupt politicians and persons, and set a good precedent for the Nigeria we want to see. Now, have we been able to achieve that? I totally doubt it. And um, I believe that the much touted uh, slang of, of the president of being anti-corrupt was totally broken, which I believe is one of the reasons why we slid, I mean, really badly, uh, we're doing so badly. Now, if you remember, one of the very interesting cases from 2022 was um, the two former governors who were pardoned by the president. Now, these two gentlemen, Yame and Ndume, had been convicted and sentenced by a, a competent court of, of law in Nigeria for being corrupt uh, up to over billions, over billions of naira. We're saying stuff that happened over 10 years ago. If you calculate what that money is in terms of inflation rate and everything, in terms of possible development for their state, we're talking, I mean, more in billions. Um, these two men were sentenced by, by the court. And it was a good time for Nigeria to say, oh, that our courts could truly sit and sentence uh, corrupt politicians. Now, what happened? not even halfway through their sentences, the president pardons these two gentlemen. If nothing else tells me that the president's uh, so much touted anti-corruption slogan is possibly not deeply rooted, that was a very good example. I mean, um, a president that had been set 
which would have made the public officers sit up, was broken on its back. They were pardoned, and four months after the pardon, they were freed. I remember looking at the photos the media ops they had. They were all smiley. Um, I mean, and the, the, remember that this index we're talking about is a corruption perception index. And it is measured, uh, taking a look at um, the perception by businessmen and experts. Also remember that it focuses only on the public sector. So we're not talking about private sector or individual corruption. We're saying the public sector. And like you said in your, in your introduction, it takes a look at how the government is able to handle corruption, how it's able to reduce bribery, how it's able to reduce nepotism, how it's able to generally reduce corruption in the public system. Now, when a court of law in Nigeria sent convicts and sentences to former governors to jail, which should have set a precedent, which I think might have improved our perception and our ranking, the president goes on to pardon them. Now, you ask me, what perception does this further lead to? Not just for the international community, but even for politicians and for public servants. It tells you that if you, I mean, if you play your cards well, you can steal as much money as you want. And all you have to do is be in the good books of whomever is the president and you get a pardon as if it never happened. What a pardon means is that your sins, just like Jesus did for your sins and wipes them away, your sins are totally wiped and forgotten. You can never again be called a criminal. You can never be referred to as such. You can sue such a person. It's a presidential pardon, the highest level of pardon for corrupt former governors. I think the president lost a very good opportunity to put his foot down and set a good precedent uh, in terms of our anti-corruption fight in Nigeria. So the president might doubt that he's against corruption. I'm yet to be convinced. Mm -hmm. uh, um, let me come to you. Uh, I, I like that Wabimo made, um, especially talked about the fact that this is more about the public sector and not necessarily, sorry, about the, um, you know, government officials than, you know, not about the private sector. But do we not also play a role in that private or uh, public sector? Because we always solely put this at the feet of government or government officials. And I mean, look at what happened recently with the fuel scarcity. Fuel, you and I cannot get access to fuel, but then the guys who were selling it in jerry cans get access to it. Um, we see what's happening in different sectors. You go to an office and you need to do, get certain things done. Well, a certain lady says, if you're not going to part with some monies, the file is not leaving her table. So if we solely say that the politicians, the guys who are in uh, public you know, office, the guys who are up there um, are the ones who this index is about. But what about us, the people? Because I'm, I'm thinking, did they fall from Mars? Well, um, corruption at the level of governance is far more damaging to the economy, far more damaging to the uh, human development indices. That are related to the welfare of the people. And that's why it's, it's critical for that to be examined on its own merit. Because 90% of all income that comes into the country uh, goes into the corporate government through uh, the crude oil sales. And so when you have all of this income, and most of it is filtered away, uh, PwC even told the government, they said, uh, right now, probably by the thousand to a thousand five hundred dollars per individual, per person, you know, is connect, is connected to corruption in this country, which is basically our GDP. Most of the uh, GDP per capita is lost to corruption. So, if you know our GDP per capita is maybe say five thousand dollars, and two thousand five hundred dollars of that is lost to corruption, that means you're left with just half of that. You know, to run governance. So that's why it's critical to examine that and and to and to 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 look at the holistic way to to attack the issue. It's cultural. It, it's become a a major problem and the system of governance which we have right now is not helping it's it's top heavy it's hegemonious it's it's, it's very expensive it's and it doesn't allow for transparency uh the, the the president came as a military person but he cannot rule as a military person he has to he has to deal with the judiciary now he has to deal with the legislature now he has to deal with state governments that have in the in, in the constitution their level of independence so he cannot by fiat you know, say whatever it is that he wants to say and make it happen. He has to negotiate his way through things. He has to give and take. He has to make compromises. And that's exactly what you saw there with the pardon issue. Hmm. You know, it was basically, I'm going to give you a pardon because I need you to do this for me. 
That's something that's been done over over uh, over and over decades ago as well. So it's a cultural problem, it's a holistic problem, it's a governance problem, and nobody has been able to get to the root of it, which is at the end of the day is greed, is poverty, is a lack of faith in the nation as a nation, a lack of patriotism. These are key reasons why people feel impunity. I can do what I like because I don't care about what happens to the people in this country. I don't care about the country itself. I don't care about the future of the country, which includes the future of their own children. Uh, so we need to really, really go back and do a deep dive as to the root causes of corruption at every level, whether it's a private level, whether it's a business level, corporate corruption, or whether it's the government level. But the one that has the greatest impact is political corruption that is exemplified by what happens at the top of government in Nigeria. I, I just want to push you a bit further. Um, because we, 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 we talk about these issues of corruption and, and nepotism or bribery. And, and just as you said in the last statement that, you know, you can do whatever and nothing's going to happen. But does this not put a question mark on our judiciary? I mean, these, these arms of government are supposed to check each other. Uh, and and the, the, I don't know if there seems to be any form of checks or balances. But then the judiciary, like we say on the streets, is supposedly the last hope of the common man. But is, it, is there really any hope in our judiciary today in making sure that people are, uh, one way or the other, like she said, like the women said, some guys are walking free today because of a presidential pardon. So why should the simple person not also want to be a politician so they could steal their share of the national cake? Sometimes it's the law itself that is weak. The, war, the law itself, the constitution and the laws and the acts that are connected to these issues are not, they're not clear cut enough for you to diligently prosecute people. So when you have a gray area, someone steals money and then he says, oh, I got approval to steal it. And then, you know, so technically speaking, he says, I cannot go against my principal because my principal says, go and collect money. And I had to go and collect the money. So I didn't steal the money. He stole the money. That's using the law, playing, playing with the law because it's gray. That's gray area. So when you go to court, there is, a, there, is, there is a presumption of innocence. And based on that presumption of innocence, diligent prosecution is required. Now, the government does not have the expertise and the capacity to diligently prosecute corruption. The people in the legislature, the, the, the various attorney generals in the state and the federal levels, most of those lawyers are, don't have the right kind of experience, and government cannot continue paying um, a, a private lawyers to prosecute its own its own cases. So essentially, the, the justices are hamstrung by the fact that this is what the law has permitted. Someone is not paying their taxes, and they go into the you know they go into the law books and use the law books as a basis for saying, well, the law permits me to do this and do that and do that. So this is all I can pay you, and the law permits it. So, so those are the key reasons why the legislature will seem to be weak, because if you go, if they, if they send someone to prison for corruption, the person goes to appeal and takes a, 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 just a little principle in the law to, you know, to, to make a case for themselves, the appeal court is going to overturn it. And then they will go to the Supreme Court. And so, some of these cases go on for 10, 15, 20 years. And governments change. And governments change. And political parties, you know, new political parties are, are, are controlling governments across the country. And then the, 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 the decision by the new government is might be that, oh, I don't want to prosecute this case anymore. It's of, it's of no political use to me. Besides, I need this gentleman in my cabinet. I need this person in my political team. So I'm not going to prosecute that case. And this is, these are the things that happen. It's the law itself you know pardon me it's 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 a piece of ass we need to change some of those laws themselves some of them are cake the laws that we you know we took over from the british that we have not tweaked you know because we're coming from a parliamentary system into a presidential system so some of those things need to be looked at by a law reform in itself by the judiciary they have to be able to do that and then it needs to go through the national assembly to ensure that new laws are passed, better laws are passed, and then the prosecution is easier, you know, once that's achieved. Okay. Well, I mean, well, I'm coming back to you now. Um, because we can't keep... I mean, there's a lot to do, but I want to ask you a two-pronged question because of, because of time. The number one reason why these people still ranked Nigeria where we are today is absence of transparency during COVID-19. Now, you and I were here. We heard about the palliatives. It became a thing. Um, and we saw the blowback of the palliatives right across the country. 
uh, and, and all the drama that was around COVID-19 and how government was being, or most of the issues and the monies were shrouded in secret secrecy. I know that um, a group called Follow the Money are still dragging the federal government on the issues of where did the money go in terms of COVID-19. Now, the second part is, do you see Nigeria coming out of the doldrums of corruption anytime soon? We're getting ready for another election season. It's happening in, a, in 24 days. Uh, how ready are we to fight corruption or stop it? Or are we just managing with corruption? <laughs> Okay, let me, let me start with your first question. Now, um, that's a very deep question. Or oh, let me start with the later one. Can we get out of the dungeon? We certainly can. I mean, like the other speakers said, Mr. George, um, where we are is, remember that we're talking about, this ranking we're talking about, I repeat, is a perception, which is why sometimes perception can determine a lot. It's a perception that people have. That's why you, you hear that, I mean, perceived justice sometimes is, is even more weight, is weightier than the justice itself. If people do not perceive that justice has been served, now, can we get there? Uh, it's easy to say that the people who become the judges and who become the lawmakers that we refer to, they come from the common man. They need the vote of the common man. Um, they, they buy the vote of the common man. They collect the PVCs of the common man. They block the common man from getting their PVCs. It's a multi-layered unfortunately multi-layered problem that I, I believe a lot of our leaders are dancing around. I mean, recently the president said he has tried his best. That's a very convenient way of saying, oh, things are bad and I pretty much did what I could and left the rest. He says he's done his best and he doesn't believe he's disappointed anyone. I am disappointed um, because the buck stops at the table of the person who was voted in and you hold the power particularly as, as the head of state. Now, can we change this perception? We can. Um, interestingly, I'm one of those who believe so much in the, in, the, in the concept called Nigeria. I believe that Nigeria can grow, that Nigeria can become better, that Nigerians can be served as citizens of their countries by the people that they vote into power. What we need, and I believe it might just be a stroke of miracle, that what we need is two tenors of two people who would put their foot down and say that we must keep corruption out. Let me put you in a tight corner quickly. My time is up. They're telling me I have to go. Looking at the 16 presidential candidates, and of course, you might not know all the governors across this, the country, but for the presidential candidates, who are these two people who would be able to put their foot down looking at the list of these presidential candidates? So easy to say, I mean, you know, I mean, I've been a journalist 11 years. These things are not easy for me to declare on public platforms. But in my personal analysis of the three topmost candidates, I'll put my faith in Peter B in the in truth. Um, and this is because we've seen what the, the other parties have done. The APC is not, is not far-fetched. I mean, they're still there. Um, so, I, I mean, and we see the clash. Some people would say that uh, internal is internal wranglings within the APC is trying to discredit the presidential candidate of the APC, but that's for them to deal with. And we see where we are. Have they done well in terms of infrastructure? Oh, yes. But so many other things could, that could have been fixed were not. I would say, let's give it a fresh shot. Let's give it a, I mean, the other two parties have had their time. Let's try a new party, like I said. A struck of miracle. Maybe this is it. Maybe this is it. And again, they already have the, when they become president, they are president, unless we vote them out again. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you. George Ashiru is the state chairman of the ADC in Lagos. And Wemi Waduni is a media strategist. And of course, uh, we always have uh, the pleasure of having great minds on this show. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank All right. Well, that's the show tonight. Uh, we will be back tomorrow. Still talking for development. I'm Mary Anacol. Don't forget, you still can get your PVC before INEC puts a stop to it. It's your passport to a new Nigeria. Have a good evening.